Welcome to worship in the Unitarian Universalist Church of Charlotte. For decades, led first by socialists, March 8th has been observed as International Women's Day. Finally, in 1975, the United Nations adopted this ordinance, this observance. March 8th is now a national holiday in nations from Afghanistan to Zambia. There's been legislation in the United States Congress to get this recognized. I'll let you guess where that lies right now. <laughs> Today, rooted in our religion's affirmation that all people have inherent worth and dignity, we lend our own energy to this celebration that will occur later in this week. At a time of so much indignity, when so many women are made to feel as if their lives do not have worth, these kinds of services serve as profoundly important, regrettably countercultural reminders. Spirituality does not pertain to some private, ethereal domain in which solitary souls commune with mystical spirits. Spirituality, transformative spirituality, takes our deepest and our highest shared values and inspires us to embody them with courage and integrity. Spirituality, transformative spirituality, is not nearly always about solitary quietude. Sometimes, sometimes it is the unrelenting summons to march. <laughs>
A strong woman is the one who can dare to raise her voice for the cause she believes in. And this strength lives in a corner in every woman's heart. It just needs to be searched. Woman, a poem by Alice Walker. They were women then, my mama's generation. Husky of voice, stout of step, with fists as well as hands. How they battered down doors and ironed starch white shirts. How they led armies, had dragged generals across minefields, booby trap ditches to discover books desks, a place for us. How they knew what we must know without knowing a page of it. Still I Rise, a poem by Maya Angelou. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trode me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes? 
shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my hauntingness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts are of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide, leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Two weeks ago, I arrived at a retreat center high in the hills of Palos Ranchos Verdes, a lofty perch commanding a stunning view of Los Angeles and its environs down below. It was unseasonably blustery, chilly, quite windy, not at all the way one imagines Southern California. There, I spent four days worshiping, learning, listening, reflecting, and talking with other senior ministers from the largest of our Unitarian 
Universalist congregations. More so than usual, it felt a little like a misery loves company experience. <laughs> In the current social, political, cultural, religious climate, ministry has become as hard as it has ever been for most of us. In the sanctuary of our assembling, we admitted as much, offered assessments more candid than usual, attesting to the ways the challenges of our times and the upheaval within our own movement makes every word and action feel more fraught. This is a group with whom I have met for more than a dozen years, three of which I served as its president. During this time, it has changed rather markedly. There's more attention to spirituality. There's a kinder and gentler tone, a more comfortable appeal to and use of prayer, a much more frequent use of explicit God language, a bit less ego, and a good bit more compassion. However, the single biggest change among the lead ministers of our largest congregations is this. There are now many more women. When I entered this group, men dominated our ranks. In the intervening years, retirement and relocation from certain male ministers have made way for a new generation of leaders, most of whom are women. This is, by my estimation, an obvious change for the better. On a day when we lend our voices to those who will mark International Women's Day this week, I lift up the ministries of my female colleagues as one profound cause for celebration. As we consider this year's Women's Day theme, Press for Progress, these bright, gifted, imaginative women are one clear indication that progress is being made. I celebrate Deb and Jan and Victoria, veteran senior ministers in our group, and I'm delighted for colleagues joining us on this way, Angela, Christina, Gretchen, Jeannie, Jessica, Kathleen, Lisa, Marianne, Meg, Nancy, Wendy, and others. So how about you? You probably don't know these gifted colleagues of mine. So who is it that you can celebrate on this day? In the world that you occupy, in the places of influence and power that you know, in the arenas of your life that get your attention and that hold your interest, who are the women you can call to mind to acclaim today? Activists, artists, authors, business leaders, community organizers, physicians, professors, teachers, tech leaders. As a nation, we have continued the long overdue effort to pull back the curtain on the horrific specter of sexual assault and indignity that still defines so much of our culture. We've seen courageous woman after courageous woman come forward to break our unspoken vow of societal silence, to say with both defiance and heartbreak, me too, me too, me too. I celebrate this utterly tragic, utterly necessary progress. I celebrate every single woman with the courage to step up and join in determined solidarity with sisters in all stations of life, 
who are breaking silences too long held. And yet, I have a concern. For all of what has come and may come from women exposing their painful experiences, we must not focus on women as victims alone. One of the most important things that we can also do is celebrate every woman who is, in Taylor Rhodes' memorable wording, both furious and magnificent. In hearing and feeling the fury, let us not fail to name and acclaim the magnificence. Women who have, as Audre Lorde puts it, dared to be powerful in so many places and ways. Women who have, in Audre and Rich's words, touched their strength and determined not to settle for less. Women who have, in Denise Levertov's testimony, heard their whole selves saying and singing what they knew, I can. Women who have, in Kimberly Williams Crenshaw's unmistakable clarity, recognized it's not about supplication. It's about power. It's not about asking. It's about demanding. It's not about convincing those who are currently in power. It is about challenging the very face of power itself. Today, even as we continue to press for progress today, is all about such women who are changing the very face of power itself. That's why I'm hopeful about the company of the clergy I know best. And yet where our ministry is concerned, we should put this in some perspective. Our often selective reading of our history, notwithstanding the progress that we are seeing in a movement now led for the very first time by a woman president, my friend, the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, who will be here with us on the last Sunday of this month. The pro this progress has been slow and hard. But some might interject, weren't some of the first women ordained in the U.S. either universalists or Unitarians? Yes, dating well back into the 19th century. While sadly, some of the largest religious traditions continue to this day to exclude women from the ranks of their spiritual leadership. Can you imagine? We broke down that barrier a very long time ago. But a deeper exploration of that history offers less cause for self-congratulations. Our own denomination admits the path for women ministers in our faith tradition has not been easy. Of those early ordained women, few were allowed to serve in full-time ministries. Others were relegated to small, struggling parishes or assistant positions alongside their clergy husbands. We owe a debt of collective gratitude to a remarkable group of women ministers who tenaciously embodied their roles. Following the Women's Ministerial Conference in 1875, 21 Unitarian women founded the Iowa Sisterhood to serve congregations throughout the Great Plains. Life was not easy among those pioneering settlers. Male ministers coming from seminaries in the East weren't vying to be called to small congregations where the work was hard and the recognition was limited. For a time, these women succeeded because they collectively brought a less academic and more pastoral approach to their congregations. Theirs was a more compassionate model of ministry. But to our detriment, 
patriarchy prevailed. The larger denomination didn't support them. Their approach was seen as, quote, an embarrassment among the clergy back in Boston. So early in the 20th century, Unitarianism's leaders began a concerted return to a more manly ministry in order to revitalize the denomination. And what became of that first wave of women ministers? Most were rushed into retirement. Others left to pursue different kinds of work. They were never a large movement. Their ministries were relatively brief, and they did not manage to transform the possibilities for women in Unitarian ministry. But the pioneering women of the Iowa Sisterhood are remembered because they managed to cast a shining vision for women who were called to minister. Might it be that seeds sown on that vast prairie over a century ago may finally be bearing the fruit I witnessed atop that California hill just a couple of weeks ago? I imagine that those persistent women of the Iowa Sisterhood would be both shocked and pleased to see women leading large congregations in California, Colorado, Minnesota, North Carolina, New Mexico, Ohio, Texas, Wisconsin, and other places as well. My classmate, my colleague, my friend, the Reverend Kathleen Owens, senior minister of our very large congregation in San Diego, attests to the import of women like the Iowa Sisterhood. She admits, when we open history books and we don't see ourselves, our lived experiences, something happens in our brains and in our hearts, in our sense of self and how we understand ourselves. Late Dr. Myra Sadker, educator and writer, echoes Kathleen's claims. Each time a girl opens a book and reads a woman less history. She learns that she is worth less. We have a history, one that both recognized women as leaders and resisted women as leaders. On a day when we're reflecting on women's accomplishments, it feels important to acknowledge the ways in which our liberating religion has been liberating and ways in which we too have resorted to practices deeply rooted in patriarchy and sexism. Now, in a time when a majority of Unitarian Universalist ministers are women, a majority of Unitarian Universalist ministers are women. We must not take this as a laurel upon which we can rest. In whatever arenas that you know, where you work or invest or understand, there is almost assuredly an Iowa sisterhood kind of story. These are the kind of stories of uneven progress, of one step forward and then two steps back, of the utterly tenacious, pernicious patriarchy. And we must tell all of these as cautionary tales. In our press for progress, we cannot relent lest we revert all too soon to something entirely untenable. In our press for progress, we cannot be sidetracked or dissuaded by men who are feigning support while continuing to act in subtly or explicitly sexist ways. 
In our press for progress, we must remain vigilant, understanding clearly that not being among the worst of the offenders hardly gives some of us men an excuse for what we have done or for what we aren't now trying to understand. And aware that our press for progress comes at a time when we are witnessing the absolute worst sorts of sexual abuse and assault called out in the very highest offices and roles in our land, this must not for us be one more occasion when we become more interested in castigating the failure of others than in examining our own flawed thoughts and behavior. For those of us who identify as male, especially for those of us who are cisgendered men, if we're honestly interested in transformation, there are obvious acts that we can and we should take. We must do our own work. We must call one another to accountability. And we must do exactly what we are learning to do in the face of other sorts of oppressions. We must step back. In every equation of imbalance, in each occasion of marginalization, transformation means, it always means, those with more power and more privilege and more possibilities must consciously choose to step back. Far too often, we imagine an additive approach that is, we're too prone to believe that transforming the dynamics of power does not require those of us who currently have privilege to give up anything, to change anything, to become in any way uncomfortable. It does not work that way. Transformation never works that way. Transformation means changing the whole form, inverting the order of things, opting to set out on a completely new way. Transformation means not just that the last should be first. Transformation also means that the first should be last. Today, we celebrate the women who persist in an abiding culture of patriarchy and sexism. Today, we celebrate the women of color who persist even as too many of their white sisters remain oblivious. Today, we celebrate the lesbians, the trans women who persist even as white, straight, cis women leaders are still learning the essential importance of intersectionality. I don't know a more forceful, ferocious vision than that of womanist writer Alice Walker in the memorable declaration she titled Democratic Womanism. Democratic womanism. I want something else, Walker announces. A different system entirely. One not seen on this earth for thousands of years, if ever. And what does that mean for her? I'm speaking of true regime change where women rise 
to take their place en masse at the helm of Earth's frail and failing ship. Walker admits there is no system now in place that can change the disastrous course the earth is on. Do you hear her? There is no system. There's no system now in place that can change the disastrous course the earth is on. Who can doubt this, she asks. The male leaders of earth appear to have abandoned their very senses. Now, Alice Walker believes we must foster places in which circles of women meet, organize ourselves and allied with men, brave enough to stand with women, men brave enough to stand with women, nurture our planet to a degree of health. For strong women who have held that vision in our history, for strong women who embody such a vision now, for strong women who are being nurtured into furious magnificence and into magnificent fury. Today, we bow in respect, in gratitude, and in solidarity. I learned at a young age that I shared a birthday with the world-renowned primatologist Jane Goodall. While I'd heard of her, I'd never known anything about her work in great detail. The birthday business, however, gave me an instant connection, even if we are 67 years apart. <laughs> Upon receiving her book, In the Shadow of Man, when I was a little older, I devoured every page, immensely enjoying her stories of the quirky characters she met in the forests of Tanzania. I admired her deeply for her determination in overcoming the chimpanzee's initial fear of humans and her dedica dedication to chimpanzee conservation efforts. The knowledge her research has given to the world is invaluable to this day. Just to think, a woman in 1960 gave the world evidence requiring the redefinition of the human species. In the words of Lewis S. B. Leakey, now we must redefine tool, redefine man, or accept chimpanzees as humans. As I have grown, reflection on what Jane Goodall has given to the world has made me consider what I, as a young person, and especially as a young woman, can give to the world. 
One day, I hope to join the global community of scientists and engineers, but in the current moments, it is important to consider the daily impacts that I can have and also the broader impacts women can have on the world. Whether it is walking miles to get water, a task performed by women across third world countries, or raising children, a task performed by women in all countries. The underappreciated sacrifices made by so many females on this earth are not only something to acknowledge, but also to celebrate. Consider where you would be without the women and girls in your life. Consider the significance of what they do. Consider their impact and honor them with your respect, appreciation, and love. Welcome to today's service. We're honored to have guests with us. Our members would like to greet you following the service, so that we might do so. If you are visiting, please raise your hand and keep it up. Members, please take note of the guests seated near you. After the service, invite them to join you for coffee and conversation in Freeman Hall. Should it enhance your experience of future services, you can find both large print order of service and personal hearing assistant devices on the table at the entrance to the sanctuary. If you'd like to learn more about us, please fill out a yellow card and place your completed card in an offering basket when they are passed later in the service. Members with a life event to share can do so on the reverse side of the card. You'll find them along with an offering envelope. On the clipboards at the end of the row, please begin passing them down your row now. Some returning visitors may be interested in hearing about how to become a member. If so, talk with our membership coordinator, Kelly Green. Her contact information is on the back of your order. Again, to each of you, welcome. I add my welcome to the one you just heard from Grace. Thank you for sharing a portion of your Sunday morning with us. If you are one of our guests, there's a session for you afterwards, should you like. It's called Getting to Know Us. It's a conversation with a longtime member of the congregation. So grab coffee or tea and meet downstairs in our conference room following the service. So we print so that you can ignore it at the top of the order, a request that you silence your phones in every service. Today, uh, we invite you to keep your phones silent, but also out. So this is a part of an international celebration. We're inviting you today, especially during the affirmation of faith, to take a photograph Post it to social media with the hashtag that we're using today, Press for Progress. The affirmation that we use is actually, today that we'll use, is actually from the International Women's Day celebration. You can find that at internationalwomensday.com. A lot of information about this celebration. So we're using words from them. I invite you, when that shows up on the screen and all of us stand to voice that affirmation together, if you'd like, snap a photo and post it to your social media with the hashtag press for progress. I see that smirk, Melissa. Yes, your minister <laughs> knows about posting knows about hashtags, knows about the in, inter, uh, the, um, <laughs> that thing Al Gore invented. <laughs> there are other ways to get involved in the life of this congregation. You'll find just a few listed in your order today. There are many more and our electronic newsletter, Currents, it's always posted on our website, and it comes to our members' inboxes every Thursday afternoon. 
Thank you to the generous pledgers in this congregation who make every single thing we're doing possible. We always hold a portion of this service to remind ourselves of those who are in need, to remind ourselves to open our hearts just a little bit wider. Today, it's so appropriate that on a day when we're celebrating powerful women, I bring before you the life of one of the most powerful women in this community. Those of you who attended our showing of 13th had the opportunity to meet the amazing Ramona Brandt, who was a part of the panel discussion that followed. For a nonviolent drug offense, Ramona Brandt served 21 years in federal prison. It would have been longer had she not been pardoned by President Barack Obama. She later had the occasion with a small group of women that he had pardoned to actually meet and talk with the president about issues and the brokenness of our prison industrial complex. Ramona came to Charlotte because there was a place for her here, in part due to our support. She came to the Change Choices House, found housing there, found support within that organization that some of you have supported so generously. And predictably, Ramona started having a huge impact on this town, advocating, working, organizing. Her reach was enormous. People were listening to her. She was beginning to make a profound difference here. Sadly, a week ago last night, Ramona died very suddenly. Today, I'll join with a powerful community at a Baptist church across town in celebrating the remarkable life of Ramona Brandt and in listening to many speakers, including my own beloved wife, who was a dear and close friend of Ramona Brandt's, remind us that in grief, the mantle becomes ours. We take up Ramona's work, even as today we celebrate her remarkable ministry and change that she made here in Charlotte.
invite us to a time of meditation and aspiration, the opportunity to breathe deeply together. I invite you today to let go of whatever it is that's in your hand, to settle yourself, ground yourself, to feel yourself held up and sustained by this place, this place rooted deeply in our mother, the earth. I invite you to slow and deepen your breathing. to bring yourself as much as possible present to this moment. We neither ignore nor avoid the tragic reality of the pain that is coursing through this world and especially through the lives of this world's women. But today we also sing and celebrate Gamba Adisa, all those who make meaning clear. We celebrate women who dare to be powerful women who have dared to use their strength in positions of prominence and recognition and in places private and out of sight, neither recognized nor celebrated. Today we call to mind these powerful women We name them aloud or in the silence of our hearts now in celebration.
even as we acclaim these lives, magnify their witness in our lives. Earth Mother, Star Mother, you who are called by a thousand names, may all remember we are cells in your body and may we dance together. Amen. We now will take an offering that allows us to exercise that all-important generosity of spirit.
please join me in an affirmation of our faith, rising in body and or spirit. We will maintain the Because of those who came before, we are. In spite of their failings, we believe. Because of and in spite of the horizons of their vision, we too dream. Let us go, remembering to praise, to live in the moment, to live mightily, and to bow to the mystery.